So Matthew 9, verses 18 through 34 is where we're going to be. Matthew 9, verses 18 through 34. And as you're turning there, I just want to kind of remind us of the overarching theme and purpose of Matthew's gospel as you all have been walking through it and seeing these themes over and over again as you've looked through these nine chapters the past several months. Uh, Just a couple weeks ago, Pastor Matt taught an overview of kind of the big picture purpose and structure of Matthew's gospel, so these aren't things that are totally new to us. But as we come to the book of Matthew, we recognize that as he gives an account of the life of Jesus, he is announcing the good news that the long-awaited, eternal kingdom of God has arrived in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Matthew writes to proclaim proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the son of David, the son of Abraham, and that he has come in fulfillment of prophecy and of promises to deliver his people and to establish his eternal kingdom. All that had been promised, all that had been foreshadowed, all that uh, the hopes of God's people had set their hearts upon, was now finding its fulfillment and its inauguration in this one who had come. The the climax of redemptive history and the establishment of God's saving reign through his son was at hand. And we need to kind of have those big picture themes in our minds as we look at these specific narratives. We kind of need the overarching purpose in mind Because Jesus' ministry, the individual narratives and accounts of Jesus' uh, healings and teaching, what it's doing is it's revealing and clarifying for us the nature of his kingdom and who he is as king. These aren't just kind of like interesting vignettes for us. They're historical narratives that really serve as a witness to the legitimacy of Christ's reign and that call us to respond to him in faith. As the true king. They teach us about what his kingdom is like and how we then are called to live as his kingdom citizens. So as we walk through uh, these several narratives from verse 18 down to verse 34, I want us to first think about four broad questions about Christ Jesus and his kingdom that are going to be addressed in the narratives that we see. As we walk through This section of scripture, we're going to walk through it linearly, but uh, I want you to have these four questions in front of you, and I'm going to kind of uh, remove all suspense because I'm going to give a brief just summary answer of what we're going to see in the text of how this section of Matthew answers and addresses these questions. So first of all, what kind of authority does King Jesus possess? Well, just by the fact that we refer to Jesus as King signifies that he has some sort of authority. So what kind of authority does this king possess? Well, in this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus holds authority over life and over death. Can't get more overarching than that. He holds authority over the physical body, over that which is clean and that which is unclean. He has meticulous and specific authority over the specific parts of the physical body. We're going to see that in his healings. And he has authority over the spiritual realm of angels and demons. Ultimately, what we're called to see is that King Jesus possesses all authority. Really, when we come to the end of Matthew's gospel and we see Jesus say that very thing in Matthew 28, 18, if we've been paying attention to Matthew's account, it really shouldn't surprise us all that much. Because we've seen Jesus speak and teach and act and heal with authority all throughout the account of his life and ministry. So what kind of authority does King Jesus possess? Secondly, what kind of kingdom has Christ come to establish? Well, we could answer this question in in many different related ways, but what I want us to see from this section of Matthew is that Christ Jesus has come to establish a kingdom in which the effects of the curse of sin and death are undone. All the ailments, all the suffering that we see in this chapter, they're all results of living in a world that is under the curse of sin. We see spiritual and physical oppression. We see sickness. We see sorrow. We see death. And Jesus has come as the fulfillment of promises that were established all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 as the one who would roll back 
the curse of sin, who would undo what was done in man and in all the created order through Adam. He is the one who will come to undo the effects of the curse of sin and death, ultimately through his own death and resurrection. Thirdly, who will be citizens in Christ's kingdom? We talk about a kingdom, the thing about a kingdom is it has citizens, it has those who inhabit the kingdom. In this section of Matthew, the clear answer is that it's those who look to him in faith. We're going to see several vivid examples of just tremendous faith in this section. And we're meant to see that the citizens of Christ's kingdom are those who have faith in Jesus as the Messiah King. Faith is the means by which we enter Christ's kingdom, and it's the defining mark of his kingdom citizens. Fourthly, how does King Jesus receive those who are his? Well, what we see in these narratives is that he receives them with kindness, with warmth, and with compassion. There's just a wonderful tone of compassion in the interactions we see Jesus having uh, with those that he interacts with in this chapter. And this reveals to us something about the character and the nature of our king. He's not a cold, distant, unfeeling monarch who's detached from his people. Rather, he's a compassionate and merciful high priest. He's near to those who are his. He cares for them in their suffering. He deals with them personally. He deals with us personally. That should be a great comfort to us. Well, let's read Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. And we'll go down to verse 34, and then we will walk through this narrative together. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. Well, first we're going to see this account of two healings sandwiched together. And we're going to see broadly that Jesus has authority over life and death and over that which is clean and that which is unclean. So beginning in verse 18, in the uh, immediate context, remembering what you all looked at last week, Jesus is answering a question from John the Baptist's disciples about fasting. And in verse 18, we're told that while Jesus is saying these things, a ruler, that is a, a leader in the local synagogue, comes up to him in this moment of crisis. Now, this is probably a somewhat familiar scene to us. We find parallel accounts of this scene in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 42, and also in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. Matthew's account is a little bit different in some of the details it presents, but all of them are meant ultimately to reveal to us the identity and the authority of Christ Jesus. So just a couple of things from those parallel passages. We know that this man was named Jairus. That he was a ruler in the local synagogue, a, a local religious authority. And we see here that he comes in and he kneels before Jesus. Immediately we see this sign of reverence and recognition of Jesus' authority. Which is significant and a little bit surprising 
Because we see so often in the Gospels the conflicts between Jesus and the religious authorities. But being a religious authority itself was not a barrier to entering Christ's kingdom. The problem wasn't the title of being a ruler in the synagogue. The problem was the spiritual blindness and hypocrisy we see so often in the gospel narratives. We then see that uh, the urgent conflict, the urgent matter that that brought Jairus to Jesus. He says in verse 18 that his daughter was dead. Now in the parallel accounts, uh, he says that his daughter was dying, or it says that his daughter was at the point of death. Here, Matthew chooses to emphasize the reality of death. There's no question here that she is dead. And what this is going to set up then is an occasion to demonstrate and to reveal that Jesus is the one who holds power over death itself. The reality of death is emphasized to show Jesus as the one who has power and authority over death. So Jesus rises up in verse 19 to go with Jairus and with those with him to his home. And on the way, there's this this interruption, this kind of intervening scene right in the middle of this already very tense scene filled with conflict. There's this other encounter kind of sandwiched in between that Matthew draws our attention to in verse 20. He says in verse 20, Behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him. This woman had suffered continually from a hemorrhage of blood for 12 years. There are several key things that I want us to focus in on, both from this passage and from the parallel passages about this woman. Uh, Because they highlight both the tragedy of her story and her reality, but also the glory and the, the miracle of what Jesus does. We, we don't get this from this, uh, this passage, but we get it from Mark's account. Here we see that this woman had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years. In Mark's account, we're told that Jairus' daughter was about 12 years old. And I think there's an intentional parallel being drawn there. Jairus' daughter had experienced 12 years of life. This woman effectively had experienced 12 years of death, suffering under this horrifying, painful condition. Mark also tells us in his account that not only was she suffering greatly, but she had spent all that she had seeking a cure. She would pursued different doctors, but the, the problem only got worse. Not only was she suffering physically, she was financially destitute as a result of her condition. Not only that, though, it gets worse for her because Not only would this woman have experienced intense physical pain, apparently physical pain that got worse over time as she sought a cure, she would have been ceremonially unclean under the Levitical law. She would have been excluded from the temple and from the synagogue, cut off from her own people culturally, but also religiously, cut off from the worship of God and the assembly of God's people in the temple and in the synagogue. Because of this physical condition, she would have been an outcast in her own society. And as we see this reality and we see this just plight of this woman, we should be affected emotionally. Our emotions should not reign supreme. They shouldn't kind of drive the bus in our lives or in our reading of Scripture. But we also ought not cast them aside when we read Scripture. When we see the tragedy of life in a sin-cursed world, as it's shown to us clearly here, we should be affected by this. Think of just the, the years of suffering, of being cut off from her own people. Think of that, that, that cycle of hope followed by disappointment. As she seeks out different doctors, thinking maybe this will be the one that cures things. Maybe this will be the one that brings improvement, only to get worse. Friends, life under the curse of sin is tragic, and we need to see that. We need to be able to say that with clarity, not because we want to be, you know, negative and dour, 
but ultimately because it makes Jesus' eternal triumph over the curse of sin even more glorious. The the tragedy of sin ultimately shines a light on what Christ has overcome and what we are brought out of and what we have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. Well, at the end of verse 20, we see that she reaches out and touches the fringe of Jesus' garment. And her words kind of show and convey the, the strength of her faith. She says to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. We can only kind of speculate uh, the extent of her understanding of who Jesus really was. We don't know if she had her finer points of Christology all mapped out. I think she certainly probably didn't. But what we do see is that she trusts in Jesus' power and Jesus' authority to heal her. We see that she pursues Jesus. We see that Jesus commends her for her faith. And again, we need to see that those who will be citizens of Christ's kingdom are those who come to him in faith. You can't be born physically into Christ's kingdom. You cannot work to earn your citizenship. You cannot take a test to get your green card into Christ's kingdom. The only means of entry into the kingdom of Jesus Christ is faith in who he is and what he has done. We also need to see here that if we were Jews reading this account, we should, at the end of verse 20, as she's reaching out to touch the fringe of Jesus' garment, we should feel a great tension. Because if someone unclean touches someone else, that person becomes unclean. So there's almost this great tension here. Is she going to make Jesus unclean? What we see instead, though, and I think this is just wonderful, is that when this woman touches Jesus' garment, instead of making him unclean, he makes her clean. He turns and he speaks to her, and instantly, verse 22 says, she's made well. Now, the other gospel accounts of this instance uh, have a longer interaction. Matthew doesn't include that. But what he does include points us just with kind of utmost clarity to Jesus' power and Jesus' authority to heal. Jesus' power to cleanse those who are unclean. And we see in this instance of this narrative a broader theological point that is being foreshadowed and that is being pointed to which is that Jesus had come to bring cleansing to his people. Not just from being ceremonially ceremonially unclean, but cleansing from that which ceremonial uncleanness had always pictured and symbolized in the first place. The spiritual uncleanness of sin that separates us from God. Christ Jesus had come to cleanse his people. To make us clean through his blood. This narrative of miraculous physical cleansing anticipates a much greater spiritual cleansing that Jesus would accomplish for his people through his death and his resurrection. And just see here again the the power and the authority of Jesus. See in verse 22 that word instantly. Instantly the woman was made well. That's the kind of decisive and final and certain authority that Jesus has. He heals her instantly. Do we see his authority in our lives? Do we see it as a good thing? Do we see that it is right to recognize that he holds all authority in heaven and on earth? And importantly, that we don't. The the right response to this narrative and the right response to seeing Jesus' authority is the response that we see in verse 33 in the crowds. To marvel. To marvel at the power and the person of King Jesus. Finally, in this uh, interaction between Jesus and this woman, notice the tone that Jesus has. Notice just the, the warmth and the compassion. He says to her in verse 22, Take heart, daughter. Addressing her in just these terms of warmth 
and endearment. And that's how Jesus receives those who are his. He's not a cold or distant or unfeeling monarch who stands high above his people. He's a merciful and compassionate high priest who is near to his people. He does reign. He is above all. But not in a way where he does not have compassion for those who are his. He he doesn't begrudgingly admit anyone into the kingdom. And he's not indifferent to those who are his. He's the good shepherd who is near to the sheep and who deals with us personally. Oh, may we be encouraged by that. And may we be a people who seek to extend that same grace and compassion and warmth to those around us. So we see this miraculous healing. We turn back then, though, to the the scene with Jairus' daughter. Remember, this is kind of an interlude in this journey to the house of Jairus. And in verse 23, we're confronted with the fact that the mourning process had begun. The flute players... And the crowds, the professional mourners, were all there kind of playing their part. And what this is meant to indicate to us is that this girl was really, truly, actually dead. She wasn't partially dead. She wasn't mostly dead. They knew in this culture how to correctly identify a dead body. And so they were doing what you would do culturally when someone had died. The, the funeral process, the mourning process had begun. They were doing what they should have done. Think of the audacity then of Jesus' words in verse 24. The girl is not dead, but sleeping. This is a familiar story, but that's a shocking statement to make at a funeral. We're a church that has hosted a lot of funerals. Imagine someone walking up to the front during a funeral and saying without an ounce of sarcasm and not trying to make some kind of broad theological point about the resurrection hope, that person in the casket is not dead. They're just asleep. That would be alarming. That would be disturbing. We'd try to remove that person from the proceedings. The crowd responds by laughing at him, which would be the right reaction to that statement unless the person saying it were the one who has authority over death itself. And so we see what Jesus does, and we see just the the marvelous work of Christ. The most essential and inescapable reality of life under the curse of sin is death. And no one has ever been able to outpace, outsmart, or out-engineer death, and people are still trying. It's a universal reality for every person who's ever lived. And here King Jesus holds power over death itself. In verse 25, he takes her by the hand and this girl arises. We're meant to look at this miracle and we're meant to see how it points us forward to anticipate the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. A kingdom where death itself is abolished and is cast out. Something else I want us to just have our attention pointed to in this passage is that notice how Jesus also renames death. I'm borrowing here from a sermon that uh, Jeff Kelly preached at his church uh, from the parallel passage in Luke, but uh, this point that he brought out was just too good not to share. So in verse 24, Jesus says, this girl is not dead, but sleeping. Do you see that shift in terminology? In the narrative, the point is that Jesus is going to raise her from the dead. But the broader theological point that we're meant to see is that because of the salvation that Christ had come to accomplish for his people, death is not the end. Physical death is not the end of our story if we're in Christ. And we actually see the early church pick up on this language describing those who have physically died while hoping in Christ as those who have fallen asleep. You can see this in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And consider just the magnitude of what this shift in language indicates. Again, death is a universal reality for every person who's ever lived. But because of the eternal salvation that Christ would secure for his people, 
If we're in Christ, the tragedy of death is nothing more than taking a nap. We have a resurrection hope of eternal citizenship in an eternal kingdom where death is no more. I was reading uh, yesterday Revelation chapter 21 and just the, the comforting words of John looking and seeing a new heavens and a new earth in which death is no more because of what King Jesus has accomplished in his death and resurrection. This narrative is just meant to be a, a beam of light pointing us forward to a greater future resurrection hope that's ours in Christ. So as we think about the question of what kind of kingdom has Christ come to establish, well, it's a kingdom in which death itself is undone because we're, we are united to the resurrected Christ. And borrowing from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that hope that we have now of a future resurrection is meant to comfort us and to push us to faithfulness to Christ Jesus now in our daily walk with Christ. May we press into this hope together, church. Death will not be the end of your story if you're in Christ. Resurrection will be the end of your story. Again, we, we are a church that, that has held and has hosted many funerals. Yes, funerals are somber, but if we are commemorating someone who has died hoping in Christ, they're also meant to be a forward-looking celebration of our eternal resurrection hope in Christ. So may we be a church that celebrates funerals well. Well, back to the narrative in verse 26, we see that the report of this resurrection spreads throughout the entire region. The, the news of King Jesus just can't stay hidden. It continues to go out. Let me pause here and just see if there are any thoughts, comments, questions, great theological disagreements, or some such. are greatly quiet. <laughs> And then it happened through a death. That death was the means to uh, undo death itself. And, and you have people who are, uh, you know, these, these uh, 